Good morning, everybody. Hope you're enjoying another beautiful sunny day. Go ahead and stand. We're going to start worship today by reading Psalm 107, verses 1 through 3. It says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Amen.
Oh
Isaiah 41.10 says, so do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. There's a grace when the heart is under fire Another way when the walls are closing in And when I look at the space between Where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me There was another in the waters Holding back the seas Should I ever need reminding Of how I've been set free There is a cross that bears the burden Where another died for me There is another in the fire There's another in the fire oh. All my debt left for dead beneath the waters I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore And should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning Either way I will bow to the things of this world And I know I will never be alone There is another in the fire Standing next to me There is another in the waters Holding back the seas should I ever need reminding What power set me free There is a grave that holds nobody Now that power lives in me There is another in the fire oh, oh. There is another in the fire the light in the darkness as the darkness bows to him i can hear the roar in the heavens as the space between where stand i can feel the ground shake beneath us as the prison walls cave in now nothing stands between us nothing stands between I can see the light in the darkness As the darkness bows to Him I can hear the roar in the heavens As the space between where stand I can feel the ground shake beneath us As the prison walls gave in Now nothing stands between us Nothing stands between us no other name but the name that is Jesus He who was and still is and will be through it all So come what may in the space between all these things unseen and this reckoning I know I will never be alone I know Never be alone There'll be another in the fire Standing next to me There'll be another in the waters Holding back the seas 
Should I ever need reminding How good you've been to me I'll count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be There'll be another in the fire Standing next to me There'll be another in the waters Holding back the seas Should I ever need reminding How good you've been to me I'll count the joy from every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be I'll count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be that that you would silence the fear that too often follows us around and too often reigns in our hearts and in our lives. I pray that you would that you would take this propensity to fear and being afraid and that you would turn that into something that you use for your purposes and I pray that you would help us to not be a people who live afraid of everything. You have you have conquered everything there is to be afraid of. 
You've already won the victory, so we don't have to be afraid of anything because we serve a God who is already victorious over everything there is to be afraid of. So, Father, I pray that you would help us to trust that, to trust in you, to not live afraid, to not be in fear, but to place our faith and our trust in you and to live in such a way that other people can see that. So, Father, I pray this morning that your Holy Spirit would move and work in our hearts and in our lives and that we would walk out of here more in love with you, more in awe of you, more wanting to serve you and to give you everything we got. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Why don't you say hi to somebody before you sit down? Thank you all for coming out on this fine Sunday morning. It's already warming up out there. It's already nice and uh, a little bit toasty. Um, if we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Lucas Jarrett. I'm the Connect Pastor here at Horizons. And uh, I want to start out this morning's announcements by just giving you a little tip. When the weather gets warm and when it gets nice, such as it's going to today, if you're going to be outside all day long, they make this thing called sunscreen and you should wear it. Because if you don't, you'll end up like me and under this shirt, I am the exact same color as I am on the outside of this shirt. There is no difference. I'm the same, I'm the same color as Zach's guitar, wherever he took that. He just ran off with it. I'm the same color as this shirt on the inside. And it's not comfortable. It's not nice. So don't be me. Don't, don't be like me. Put on sunscreen. Wear it. You will thank yourself later if you don't put yourself in the spot that I have put myself in. So there's just a little tip to start out your Sunday. If you're going to be outside, put some sunscreen on. It'll make your day better, and it'll make the next day better too. All right, now that you've got your tip out of the way, good morning and welcome. Uh, if you are new or recent, a uh, special welcome to you guys. And uh, if you're new or recent, you're probably trying to, you know, get your footing around here a little bit. So if you want to pop right over here to this welcome sign where the welcome room is, where that just lit up over there, Pastor Josiah will be over there after the service. And uh, he'd love to shake your hand, introduce himself, and give you a little info about the church and how you can get plugged in here at Horizons, all right? Um, also, if you guys haven't downloaded the app, want to continue to encourage you guys to do that. We do it every week. We're going to do it every week forever and ever probably. Um, so if you haven't downloaded it, if you're not using it, we encourage you to download it. Use it. Uh, there's some good in-service tools that you can access through that, and uh, one of those is giving. And uh, that's one of several different ways you can give here at Horizons. We are always thankful for your guys' generosity. So if you want to continue giving or start giving, you can do so several different ways. Like I said, you can get to that through the app. You can use any of the method methods you see there on the screen, or you can uh, put your gift in this envelope right here, and you can drop it in the bucket on the way out of service today. All right. I have a few special announcements, uh, same as last week, rolling them over again. We've got VBS coming up for the kids July 6th through the 8th. Oh, looky there. We got a graphic. I didn't notice that first service. Uh, we got a fancy thing. So we got uh, VBS coming up for the kids July 6th through the 8th. Uh, so if you've got kids in Kelly's area or if you've got nieces or nephews or grandkids or neighbors got kids, whoever it is, um, this is going to be a pretty awesome thing for the kids. So get them, bring them out, sign them up. You can do that over by the kids area after the service. And also, not just uh, do we want kids to sign up for this, we need adults. We need some of you guys to volunteer and to help us make this happen. Uh, VBSs and stuff like that doesn't just happen magically. We've got, ooh, we got music. Uh, we've, got, uh, we've got a lot of uh, things that need to be done, and they can only be done by people volunteering, helping out, being the hands and feet that makes this thing go. So if you're able to volunteer, if you're interested in volunteering, you can also sign up right outside the kids' area, and uh, we need your help to make this thing happen, all right? Another thing, uh, we've got a youth camp coming up July 12th through the 14th. We've got a video about that, so I won't talk too long about it. But uh, it's going to be July 12th through the 14th. It's going to be here at the church. We're going to have a guest speaker come in. It's going to be uh, another great time. So if you've got teenagers, if you are a teenager, uh, if the neighbors are teenagers, if nieces and nephews are teenagers, grandchildren, whoever, same thing, same rules apply. Sign them up. There's more info out at the kiosks in the foyer. Um, this is going to be a pretty cool event. And uh, last but not least, we have a young adult thing. Right before the uh, youth camp, which is July 12th through the 14th, on July 11th, the speaker is coming in a day early just to do a special event for young adults. So if you are involved in New Wine or you've heard about New Wine, the young adult stuff, anything college-aged-ish, give or take a few years, we'd love to have you be a part of that event on July 11th, all right? 
I believe that is all the special announcements. The only other thing is the prayer room right over here to my left, your right. Um, if at any point in time you'd like somebody to pray with you, they would be more than happy to do that. So pop right over there and make use of that. All right. I believe that's it for me. Take a look at the big screens and then Pastor Josiah will be up to deliver the message. I love the past two conferences I've been at, especially with my friends' relationships. Their relationship with me and with God have changed a lot. Cornell Jordan has been my influencer. If you're in middle school or high school or know anyone in middle or high school, I would not miss this conference. Cornell is one of the best people I know, one of the best speakers I know. In each of the um, conferences I've been to, they were like one of the best messages I've ever heard, one of the most life-changing messages I've ever been to. The worship was fantastic, very life-changing. Everyone I knew who went had a fantastic time. I just like how um, people would just give their lives to God and how many people during worship um, worship God and how close people get to God. I am most excited for the worship because after hearing Cornell's speech and getting into the worship, it's just a whole nother experience than what it normally feels like. It is, you're actually getting into God's presence and it is one of the best feelings out there. Definitely invite a friend and he will help you with your relationship with your friends and with God. I just like how um, I go to the altar and you just feel relieved and how many people actually pray and um, try to change. I encourage you to bring your friends, your f family, brothers, sisters, friends, middle school, high school, wherever you are, come. It is a great time. It can change your life. It is one of the most exciting experiences out there. Do not miss it. Don't miss it for the world. Grinnell is one of the best speakers I know, so get there. What I look forward to most and I'm so excited to see is teenagers' lives being changed in a very real way by Jesus. We would like to invite you to this year's conference entitled All In. It'll be held July 12th through the 14th from 9.30 a.m. to 8.30 p.m. at our Lost Creek campus. We are gonna have three packed, fun-filled days with food, games, friends, and most importantly, time where we get to seek Jesus through worship and the Word. This year's speaker is going to be Pastor Cornell Jordan. We are so excited, and if you have any questions, please feel free to talk to your campus pastor or youth pastor for more information. We encourage you to bring a friend, and we can't wait to see you there. Hi, moms and dads. If your little one finds it difficult to remain quiet in today's worship service, please be courteous to those around you and take advantage of our cry rooms located in the back of the sanctuary. If the cry rooms are occupied, we have tables and sofas for family viewing in our cafe. Either way, you'll be able to see and hear everything and your child will enjoy the extra freedom. And now, here's your assistant campus pastor, Josiah Pitts. As Lieutenant Richard Winters read the typewritten document that had just been handed to him, he couldn't believe what he was reading. His company commander, Captain Herbert Sobel, was punishing him under the 104th Article of War for failure to follow a lawful order. Now, in civilian terms, what that means is Lieutenant Winters was being brought up on misdemeanor charges, which could have meant up to 30 days in base custody. But Winters' record was impeccable, so he was at a complete loss as to what he could be in trouble for. And as he scanned through the document, he then came across what he was being cited for. Failure to inspect the base latrine at 0945 a.m. The problem with that was that he had not been ordered to inspect the latrine at 945. He had been ordered to inspect the latrine at 10 a.m., which meant that Captain Sobel had changed the order at the last minute without telling him which, in other words, meant that he was just going out of his way to get young Lieutenant Winters in trouble. Now, all this petty drama was happening because Captain Sobel, even though he was the commander of the company, was a very petty and insecure leader. He had neither the respect nor the admiration of his men. Uh, he was the kind of guy who created maximum anxiety over details of minimal significance. For example, he would line up soldiers for inspection, and if he found one he didn't particularly like, he would uh, single him out and mark him up, not for a rusty bayonet or for an unclean rifle, but for something as ridiculous as dirty ears. 
And on top of that, he was an incompetent field commander. You could stick a compass in front of him, a map, and tell him that way is north, and in five minutes he would still be lost. And that was a problem, a major problem, because Sobel, along with Winters and the rest of his company, were members of the 101st Airborne Division. And they were scheduled in just a few months to jump into Normandy as part of the D-Day operations for the invasion of occupied Europe, which meant that they were supposed to be the best of the best. But time after time after time, Captain Sobel demonstrated by his pettiness and by his incompetence that he was not the best of the best. And he knew it, and he knew his men knew it. And that made him feel very insecure as a leader. Contrast that with Lieutenant Winters, who was loved and admired by the men and could get the job done out in the field. They respected him, and they, they wanted him to be the man who led them into combat. And of course, Winters' popularity filled Captain Sobel with bitter jealousy. And so, for the better part of the whole year they were together in training, Captain Sobel set out to undermine the rising star of this young new lieutenant. So, the better part of a year, Winters endured Sobel's petty vindictiveness very patiently. But it all finally came to a head on that day when he was cited for missing that latrine inspection. So he took the document, marched to Captain Sobel's quarters, walked in, rendered a salute, and said, Sir, I didn't know that the order had been changed from 10 a.m. to 9.45. To which Sobel replied, Well, I telephoned your room and I sent a messenger. But when Winters pointed out there was no telephone in his room, so that was impossible, and that no messenger had ever reached him, Sobel just waved him off and said, Take the punishment like a man, be a good officer, and be quiet about it. So it looked like a lose-lose situation for winners. On the one hand, he could accept charges of misdemeanor he didn't commit. Or he could play Sobel's tactics, take matters into his own hands, and he could... ...meant rebellion amongst the men and try to get things to go his way, the old-fashioned way. But even though Winters wanted justice to be done, he didn't want to violate army decorum by dressing down as commanding officer. That's just not the way you do things in the army. But he did have one other option, and he decided to take it. He asked that that article of punishment be upgraded to a full court martial, which would mean that a military tribunal would have to be set up, and witnesses would have to be brought forth, and cross-examinations would have to be done, and Captain Sobel would have to give a full account of his actions, and it would probably come to light that he hadn't been as forthright about that telephone call and sending that messenger as maybe he had said he was. So Winters was willing to wait Sobel out patiently in this regard. But when the company's sergeants got wind of what was going on, they became so frustrated that they decided to take matters into their own hands. They decided they were going to go to company headquarters, demand that Sobel be replaced as commander, or else they would surrender their stripes and refused to go into combat with this unit because they had become so convinced that Sobel was an incompetent commander. Now, when Winters heard about this, he went to the men, and rather than taking advantage of the situation and trying to stir them up and saying, yeah, you know, this has been a pretty rough time. We probably ought to do something about this whole situation. You guys ought to go do that. Rather than taking advantage of the situation, Winters went to the men and said, that's mutinous. You need to stop that. He's our commanding officer, whether we like it or not, and there's a way that things are done in the army. So what we're going to do is we're going to do things the right way, and we're going to hope that everything pans out nicely at HQ and let them try to settle things. Well, charges came to headquarters. They reviewed them, considered an upgraded court-martial, but when they realized what was going on, they saw that Sobel was acting so petty, so vindictive, that eventually they just dropped the case entirely And eventually, they transferred Sobel out of command of that unit, which paved the way for the patient and faithful winners to become the commander of that company. So it was Winters, not Sobel, who dropped in with those men into Normandy in June of 1944. And it was Captain Winters who led those men all the way to Bechtesgaden, which was Hitler's palatial retreat in the Bavarian Alps, He led them there in April of 1945 to secure victory for the Allied forces. Now, Lieutenant Winters received a unique education in what we might call the school of hard knocks. All those encounters with Captain Sobel. He clearly had what it took to lead the company from the beginning all along. 
And even though his commander was incompetent and he probably could have undermined things and gotten his way, he wasn't willing to undermine so well because he wanted to do things the right way. So he decided to wait as second in command of that company and let things pan out according to army regulations. And of course, his patience ended up paying off. Now, I'm sure that he endured this man's pettiness for the better part of a year. I'm sure that there were times that became very frustrating and probably felt a little bit like a waste. But as a matter of fact, when he was looking back on this later in his life, Winter said that all this time under Sobel, all the vindictiveness, all those interactions, it all prepared him to be the commander that he needed to be. Because when he was serving under Sobel, he had to learn to be patient. He learned to wait. He learned to do the next right thing the right way at the right time. And those are all essential skills if you're going to be a good combat commander. Now, even though we may not be dealing with a petty commanding officer on the eve of a great war, I'm sure many of us will or have found ourselves in many similar situations. Perhaps the helplessly irresponsible relative who's never been able to get their life together has a baby before you do, even though you and your spouse have been trying for years and there you are waiting to hold a baby and change diapers while your irresponsible cousin somehow managed to have a baby. Or maybe you're waiting in the office for the next career. Somehow the guy who can't open a Word document to save his life and always blasts everyone else in the office somehow gets the advance before you do and you're forced to wait it out and see what's going to happen next in the office. Or maybe it's just as simple as everything seems to be falling into place for everyone around you except for you. And you're stuck waiting wondering what's next. And when we find ourselves in those kinds of situations, the temptation may be to try to take matters into our own hands in order to get what we want. Because that's what the sinful world does and tries to tell us to do. It's what the Herbert Sobels of the world will try to do. It's what those company sergeants almost did. But if we want to be the kind of Christians who walk worthily of the gospel... If we want to be the kind of people who can be said to be after God's own heart, then when those moments of waiting come, we must learn patience in the school of hard knocks. We must learn to wait on God and do the next right thing the right way for the right reasons as we trust that God will let everything fall out according to His good and perfect plan rather than trying to take matters into our own hands. But this isn't unique to us. Because as a matter of fact, God prepared Israel's favorite king for his reign by teaching him just such lessons. He also served under a very petty and vindictive and insecure man. And because of that, he has much to teach us about learning to wait on God in faith when everything around us seems to be going wrong and when life seems to be hard and other people seem to be, in spite of all of their incompetence or their sin, getting it better than we are. Because even though there were opportunities for this man to take matters into his own hands several times and force God's plan, he refused to do so because he was the kind of man who was willing to trust that God would do what God said he would do. And he was willing to let things fall out according to God's plan and timing. And that leads us to this first encouragement. To be people after God's own heart, we must submit to his timing rather than forcing our own. Now, we all remember David as the man who killed Goliath and became the most beloved king in Israel. But before the royal crown was placed on his head, a shepherd's staff was placed in his hand and he spent his adolescent years tending the sheep of his father Jesse in the village of Bethlehem. It was a tireless, long, thankless job, but it was out in those sheepfolds and those green pastures leading stubborn flocks of sheep to still waters that David learned to be faithful with whatever God entrusted to his care, no matter how small it may have seemed to others. It was out in those sheepfolds that David began to learn what it is to wait patiently on God in faith. Contrast that with Saul, who was the king while David was out in those sheepfolds. Saul was an insecure and fearful king who 
feared men more than he feared God. And because of his fears, he never could learn to wait on God in faith. He always had to try to go around God. Always had to try to take matters into his own hands and force his own timing onto things. And there are two incidents in Scripture that really demonstrate this quite vividly. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, we read that the Philistine army is right outside of Israel's doorstep. And when the soldiers went out to look at the Philistine army, they saw soldiers as far as the eye could see. North to south, east to west. It looked like an ocean of soldiers had arrayed themselves in battle. So, following the lead of their king, the men became frightened and a great number of them went and fled and hid themselves. Some went into caves to hide. When the caves filled up, there were some who dared to enter into the tombs of the dead to try and hide. And when the caves and the tombs were filled, some soldiers got so desperate that they found whatever cistern or hole in the ground they could find and plopped down into those to try and get away from the battle. Everyone was frightened almost to death. But then the prophet Samuel came to Saul and said, Don't be afraid, because in seven days' time, I'll meet you at a place called Gilgal, I will make a sacrifice to the Lord and I will entreat God's favor on your behalf so that you can go into the battle and he will give you the victory. So Saul and the men waited. Seven days came and passed. But as the end of that seventh day drew near and the sun was beginning to descend in the sky, Saul looked out on the horizon and Samuel was nowhere to be seen. And so frightened and insecure as he was, he did something drastic. He took matters into his own hands and he took that sacrifice that Samuel was going to offer and decided he would offer it himself, which was not lawful for him to do. Because he somehow had in his head that he could still attain the blessing of God if he violated the word of God. But as the smoke from the final offering was rising into the heavens, who came walking along the horizon but the prophet Samuel? And when he came up and saw what Saul had done, he asked him, What is this you have done? Saul offered some lame excuse. Samuel was having none of it. And he said, Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, the Lord has rejected you as king. And he has chosen a man after his own heart. One he will raise up as king who will keep his word, unlike you, faithless Saul. And even though the Israelites won the battle against the Philistines, Saul did not learn his lesson. He did not learn that it is better to wait on God in faith and let God work things out according to his timing, rather than trying to take matters into your own hands and force your own. Because just two chapters later in 1 Samuel 15, God sent Saul to destroy the Amalekites. You remember the Amalekites were the people who needlessly fought against the Israelites as they were leaving Egypt during the Exodus. So God sent Saul to destroy them and he said, take no quarter, take no prisoners and destroy all the spoil. So Saul mustered the men, they gathered their weapons, they went and fought against Amalek and by God's help, they got the victory. But then as the soldiers were wandering around and they started looking at the fattened calves and the sheep and the oxen and all the riches of the spoil, they started thinking to themselves, gosh, what a waste it would be to destroy all this spoil. I mean, we could take some of this and we could even offer it to the Lord. And so Saul, unwilling to interfere with the people because he was so insecure, just let them take whatever they wanted in violation of God's direct word. And on top of that, for reasons that we're not entirely sure of, whether it was out of pity for the defeated king or whether it was because he wanted a trophy to parade back to his palace, Saul spared Agag, the king of Amalek. So when Samuel once again came walking along the horizon and found Saul, he went up to him and said, what is this bleeding of sheep I hear in my ears? You were supposed to destroy all this. And Saul offered another lame excuse and said, well, the people wanted it. And, you know, we could offer it to the Lord as a sacrifice. And again, Samuel was having none of it and said, once again, you have rejected the word of God. God has rejected you as king. You see, Saul just could not and would not learn to wait on God in faith. He would not do what God asked him to do. He would not do the works God sent him to do. Because deep in his heart, he had a fundamental distrust of God. 
He did not believe that God would work everything out for his good. And so, fearful as he was, he always had to take matters into his own hands. So, God sent the prophet Samuel to the sheepfolds of Bethlehem to anoint a new king for Israel. One who would not be faithless like Saul, but who would take God at his word and who would be willing to wait on him and trust that he would work all things out. David, the son of Jesse, that was the man after God's own heart. So David was not destined to remain in the sheepfolds of Bethlehem. And even though Saul was still technically on the throne, been rejected by God as king, but he still wore the royal crown for a time. Yet that did not prevent David from acting like a king after he'd been anointed. Because shortly after his anointing, a giant of the Philistines named Goliath challenged Israel's armies and mocked them and mocked the living God. And David would have none of that. So he acted like a king. And he did what no soldier in Israel's army had the courage to do. He took a smooth stone, dropped it into his sling, sprinted out across the valley of Elah, slung that stone into Goliath's head, and when it sank into his head, that giant came crashing down to the earth. And then David ran up to him, took the sword out of his sheath, and rent his head from his shoulders, and gave Israel the victory. And at first, Saul was very excited about this deliverance. But then, someone got an idea. Someone wrote a little song about David's exploits. A hit song that was soon being sung on the lips of every Israelite. A song that went like, Saul has slain his thousands. And David has slain his tens of thousands. And when Saul heard that, his petty, insecure heart just couldn't take it. Because he thought to himself, well, they're ascribing just thousands to me the king, but to David, this little shepherd boy from Bethlehem who's killed one giant, they're ascribing tens of thousands, and what more can he have then but the kingdom? And so one day, giving into his paranoia, Saul was sitting in his house, and David was there playing the harp, and Saul picked up his spear, and he looked at David, and he took that spear and lifted it to his head, and threw it and tried to pin David to the wall and tried to kill him. Now, David escaped. But for the remainder of Saul's days, he set out to undermine and kill David because he just couldn't handle the thought that this young man would ascend to the throne and that his star would outshine his. And although we don't know for certain based on the scriptures how long this all lasted, it's likely that for the better part of eight years, David was running from Saul. Which means that for eight years, Israel's anointed king wasn't even on Israel's throne. For eight years, David had to endure the school of hard knocks and wait for God to put the crown upon his head. But then one day... An opportunity came along where David could take things into his own hands. An opportunity to rush himself to the throne and take that crown that had been promised to him by God. And the question then became, would David follow Saul's example and take matters into his own hands? Or would he still wait on God and let God work everything out according to his purposes? Well, here's what we read in 1 Samuel 24, verses 1 to 7. Saul was told, David is in the desert of En Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 able young men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. He came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there and Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. The men said, this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Afterward, David was conscience stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him. For he is the anointed of the Lord. With these words... David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. 
And Saul left the cave and went his way. So even here, rather than force his own timing, take matters into his own hands, kill Saul and take the crown, which I don't think anyone would blame him for doing. And God had anointed him king. The throne was rightfully his, and this insane man had been hunting him down and hounding him for years now. I mean, I don't think anyone would blame him if he had killed Saul and taken the crown. I don't think anyone would bat an eye. And yet, that wasn't good enough for David, because David was a man after God's own heart. And he wanted to be wholly obedient and pleasing to the Lord, which meant that he was not willing to lay a hand upon a man who once had been filled with the Spirit of God and whom God had chosen to lead his people. So David was willing to wait. And after all those years in the wilderness, his faith had been deepened. All those years of waiting have prepared him to be the kind of king that Saul could never be. Because Saul wouldn't have done that. But David has continued to become the kind of king That Israel needs because he's continued to deepen his trust in God. Because he is willing to wait on God. And such patience and good faith is something all of us Christians must learn. And we often learn it in the school of hard knocks. And we know that none of us are exempt from this lesson. Because not just David had to learn this. Christ went through this school too. Jesus, the son of David had to endure this kind of hardship. Because you remember, Jesus, after he was baptized, anointed with the, not just oil, but with the spirit beyond measure, was sent out into the wilderness for 40 days of tempting and testing. And you remember one of the things that Satan tempted him with? Satan said, all the kingdoms of the world are mine. And I can give them to whom I will. And I will give them to you. If you will but just bow down and worship me. Now think about how extraordinary that is. Here's Christ, the king of the world. Christ, who created all the universe. Who all he had to do was speak. And stars came into being. If anyone has a right to the kingdoms of the world, it is Christ. And yet, the father's will for the son was that he would be a servant on earth and he would take on flesh and be made like us in every way and that meant that he would not reign over the kingdoms of the earth like the kings of the earth Jesus knew that he would have a kingdom but he knew that his father was going to give him that kingdom not Satan Satan wanted Jesus to take the crown without the cross. But Jesus was not willing to take matters into his own hands like that. Instead, he submitted himself fully and completely to his father's will, trusting that when the father would give him a kingdom, he would give him a kingdom. And he would do it without any help from Satan. And so Jesus, too, learned this. Learned to submit to his father's will patiently. So if not only David, but Christ had to go through this kind of school, then it stands to reason that we will too, won't we? We will have to learn to wait on God as David did, as Jesus did. But let me be clear about this. Waiting is not the same thing as passivity. Because Neither David nor Jesus just kicked their feet up and sat on their laurels. They waited on God by doing the next right thing in front of them. They waited on God by entrusting themselves To him in prayer. They waited on him. By doing whatever it was he gave them to do that day. So if you find yourself in the school of hard knocks. If you find yourself wondering what's next. Waiting on God. Wondering when he will fulfill his purposes for your life. You want to be the kind of person who can be said to be after his own heart. Then wait on him patiently. Trust him. Entrust yourself to him in prayer. And do simply the next right thing in front of you as you wait on him to fulfill his good plans and purposes for you. And you will find the word of the prophet is true that says, God acts on behalf of those who wait 
for him. Now, I understand that sounds really nice when we're not actually in the midst of waiting on God. But then we ask, you know, what about the times when we have been waiting patiently, when we have been doing the next right thing, when we are submitted to his timing, and yet day after day, year after year, things just don't seem to be working out. And in fact, it seems as if maybe God has gone quiet or maybe he's forgotten us or things are just continually becoming unnecessarily difficult. What do we do in those moments when it feels as if perhaps God is not as near as he once was? Well, David had to learn that lesson too. He faced that test. And that leads us to this next truth. To be people after God's own heart, we must seek after him on his terms, not ours. You see, near the end of these eight years of running... Both David and Saul came to separate moments of crisis. For Saul, we read in 1 Samuel 28 that once again, the Philistine army is on Israel's doorstep, ready to smash them into oblivion. And Saul, frightened as he is, tries to seek out the word of the Lord. But yet, he's rejected the word of the Lord and God had rejected him as king, so God wasn't speaking to him. And so in his fear, Saul once again did something drastic. He took matters into his own hands by disguising himself, taking two men with him, and going to a little village of Endor to see a woman. He found her, went into her house, and said, Raise up for me a spirit. The woman looked at him with wide eyes and said, Well, you know that King Saul has put the mediums and necromancers out of the land because that's forbidden in the law. That's in the Mosaic law. Like, I will be put to death if I try to do this for you. And Saul says, well, as surely as the Lord lives, nothing will happen to you. So the woman says, well, then who will you have me raise for you? And Saul looks at her and says, raise up for me the prophet Samuel. Somehow the spirit of Samuel does rise up. He says to Saul, why have you disturbed me from my rest by bringing me up? And Saul says, well, I wanted your guidance. God's not speaking to me. To which I can imagine the spirit of Samuel shaking his head and saying, and you thought that because God wasn't speaking to you, talking to the dead was going to help? You thought that because God wasn't speaking to you, violating God's word to try and hear from him was going to help? No. He did not offer Saul, the word of comfort and guidance he was looking for, he merely pronounced the same sentence of judgment he had pronounced twice before with a grim air of finality. The Lord has rejected you, Saul, because you rejected him. And you and your sons are going to die on the mountain which you fight on. You see, the problem for Saul was not that he sought the word of the Lord. It was the way in which he sought the word of the Lord. God wasn't speaking to him through the normal means. He wasn't speaking by the prophets or through the priests. And so he decided to go the illicit route. He tried to go around the normal means. And in doing so, he destroyed his soul. He just could not learn to trust in God. He did not humble himself and repent of his sins when God didn't speak to him. He tried to go and speak to the dead. And he destroyed his soul in the process. But about 75 miles south of where Saul was, David and his men were just returning to the village of Ziklag. You see, David finally got so tired of running from Saul that he eventually, the last couple of years, spent hiding amongst the Philistines. But when they went to battle with Israel again, the soldiers started thinking, David is the guy who they sang that song about, slain tens of thousands. And that was talking about Philistines. So we should probably send him away so he doesn't turn on us and fight against us. So David and his men marched 75 miles south to Ziklag. And after 75 miles of marching, Over the course of three days, they were tired, worn out. I'm sure they were expecting a warm greeting from their wives and their children and ready for all the comforts of home. But when they came to Ziklag, they did not find their wives or their children ready to greet them. They did not find the comforts of home waiting for them. They saw smoke rising from the village because it had been burned. 
Their homes had been destroyed, and their wives and their children had been kidnapped by a raiding group of Amalekites, those same people that King Saul had failed to destroy. So after eight years of running with David, eight years of being hounded like animals, eight years of wondering whether or not God had forgotten his promises and whether or not David would ever actually wear the royal crown, the men finally had enough. They actually started talking about stoning David and killing him for all this trouble that he had brought on them. And in that moment of crisis, once again, David was faced with a choice. Would he try to take matters into his own hands and try to save his own skin his own way, like Saul had done? Or would he trust God and let him work all things out? Well, here's what we read in 1 Samuel 30, verses 3 through 8. So after, <clears throat> when David and his men reached Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. David's two wives had been captured, Ahanoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. But David found strength in the Lord his God. Then David said to Abiathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. Abiathar brought it to him, and David inquired of the Lord, Shall I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? Pursue them, he answered. You will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. So after eight years of enduring the school of hard knocks, David is even a more a man after God's own heart. Because unlike Saul, even when he's in a desperate moment of crisis, David has shown that he will seek God on God's terms. That he will not try to take matters into his own hands. All of his experience in the wilderness, all these years running, all these years waiting, have made him just the kind of faithful king that God had called him to be and that Israel needed. He had become, as the author of Hebrews might have said it, the kind of person who through faith and patience has inherited the promises. So if and when we find ourselves in moments of crisis, let's not try to circumvent God. Let's come to him on his terms. It is so easy to try and go and find God and hear from him outside of the things that he's told us to do. Let us seek him where he can be found. Let us listen to him where he speaks. And that's right here. God speaks to us in his word. That's what David did. He went and found God where he was. He went and listened to God where he spoke, which was with the priest. We have that word right here in this book. God has promised to give us the strength that we need through his word in this book. He has promised to speak to us. God speaks to you through the words of this book. Don't go looking for divine guidance in a horoscope or in some magical inner light or some, some crazed guidance from the sinful and broken world. They don't know God. God has told us where to go to find him. It is here in his word. We hear him here as the scriptures are preached, as they are praised, as they are sung, as we read them with a heart of faith. That doesn't mean that the scriptures are like a magic eight ball where you get an answer to every single question you could possibly ask. What it does mean is that everything that pertains to faith in Christ and living a godly life and needing the strength of God that you require when you are in a moment of crisis and waiting, God has promised to supply it through Jesus by faith right in this book. He will give you the strength through these words to do the next right thing while you wait. So if you want to hear God speak, don't go, look any, don't go looking anywhere else. Come here. Doesn't I mean at the end of the day, where else will we go? Where else will we go? Christ alone has the words of eternal life. Christ alone speaks the word that makes us new. Christ alone gives us the strength we need to do the works he's prepared for us before the foundation of the world. 
So why not come to him? Let him speak that word that your heart longs for. Because the question for us is, will we too be among those who, like David, inherit the promises of God through faith and patience? Because we all must wait on the Lord. We all must. The question is, is will we view those seasons of waiting with grumbling in our hearts, thinking that God is putting us through unnecessary hardship, and will we try to then to take matters into our own hands? Or will we view those seasons of waiting as God preparing us for the works He's called us to do, and giving us an opportunity to deepen our faith and our trust and our love in Him? Because there are opportunities we have in the wilderness of waiting that we simply do not have anywhere else. And you don't know how patient you are until you're forced into a situation where you have to be patient, right? You won't know what kind of faith you have or where your faith can deepen until you are put in a position where all you can do is entrust yourself to the care of God. So if you find yourself feeling the difficulty of waiting for the next career move, trust in God as you wait on Him and do the next right thing in the meantime. If you are waiting for some prodigal family member to finally come back home, entrust them to the care of God in prayer and do the next right thing while you wait. Or if, as I'm sure all of us feel, you feel overwhelmed by the state of this sinful and broken world, and you find yourself longing for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells, then like the Apostle Peter said, be diligent to be found by God without blemish or spot and at peace while you wait. Because God acts on behalf of those who wait. Because it is here that God is preparing us for the life we want and for the works we're called to do. And if by God's grace we endure to the very end, there is laid up for us not a mere crown of gold that will tarnish and decay like the crown that Saul or David or Solomon wore. There is laid up for each of us the everlasting crown of life and righteousness that cannot be taken away from us, that the Lord longs to give to us. So I encourage all of us, by the grace and by the power of Christ, wait on God. Do the next right thing he puts in front of you. And trust that he does act on behalf of those who wait. Father, you know that we need your help to do that. Because you know how prone we are to grumble when we have to wait. You know how impatient we are, how tempted we are to take matters into our own hands. God, you know how quick I am to murmur at a little traffic delay. Now teach us to wait, God. Strengthen us and empower us by your Spirit so that we too, through patience and faith, might inherit your promises. And help us to do the works you have called us to do while we wait. We do entrust ourselves to your care knowing that you are doing better for us than we could ask or imagine. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Horizons Church, I love you, and best of all, God loves you. Go in his grace and his peace this week.